Okay, uh, before I proceed, uh, I will have to mention up front that um, we won't be able to actually perform hands-on session today because the original hands-on session was planned with um, uh, server infrastructures that we should have actually bought that, brought that physically with trainers so that they can actually help you to uh, troubleshoot during the session and so on. But what I have done now is that I have uh, prepared a uh, presentation slide in such a way that I explain what we normally do. But if any of you are interested about knowing more about this, how do we do it uh, uh, by ourselves, the hands-on part of it, I am more than happy to actually share this on a, on a later session uh, beyond this uh, workshop. So just feel free to contact me if you have, uh, if you're interested to know more about the practical part of it. Okay, so I will start immediately with my third component. Oh, my, my last uh, talk, which is also the last talk of the day, uh, which is bot and detection and monitoring. So this is technically my hardcore field that I work with. And uh, just to officially introduce myself, I'm actually uh, also associated with this Athene group, which is the National Research Center for Applied Cybersecurity in Germany called, uh, yeah, okay, it's called Athene. <laughs> okay, um, today I'm going to present about how botnet detection and monitoring taking place. I can't promise that I can finish it in the next 50 minutes, but I will try my best. And the outline of our talk today is we will briefly look into what are malware, as I promised yesterday, what are botnets, what are the different architectures, what is called C2 channels. We will look specifically on peer to peer botnets, understanding the threat mitigation lifecycle. And finally, very brief uh, uh, outlook on what is the DCNDS peer to peer botnet detection mechanism that is in, in the context of this project. So, this workshop is part of that project. Uh, how are we doing it? And so on. Okay, uh, malware. What is malware? Malware actually stands for malicious software. The definition is that it's a, it's a software that is specifically designed to disrupt, damage, or gain unauthorized access to a computer system. Some examples of malware would be uh, virus, ransomware, spyware, adware, and so on. So there are quite a number of um, types of malware. So we don't actually call it virus. Virus is just a subtype of malware. So um, there, there are many examples of it. We will look into a few of them. But before that, let's try to understand how malware evolved over time. So its inception uh, started in 1980s, where uh, you start seeing this uh, malware called Elk Cloner, which first infected Apple machines in 1981. Uh, well, basically, malware that came in the early 80s required user intervention. You have to install it by yourself. You have to execute it yourself. and um, this is how it uh, it was. And the um, motivation of such malware in the past was just fun. Right? So if, if you execute it, it will just uh, have a dialog box saying something like this. Right? It will get onto all your disk. It will infiltrate your chips. Yes, it's clone. So it's a poem and, and stuff like that. It could also delete files, but it still required user intervention. And about 1990s onwards, you started seeing uh, exploit and evasion techniques. So now you don't need user intervention anymore. You started uh, seeing malware that is exploiting vulnerabilities that are found, and they start having antivirus evasion. For example, the infamous Morris worm or the uh, Melissa uh, worm. At this stage, the malware were all, uh, how do I say, um, motivated by curiosity. What can I do over the network, for example? Right, so they start having features like erasing hard drives, leaving backdoor. Mm -hmm. So once I infect the machines, I will create a backdoor so that I, I as the attacker, can then log in and do something about the machine. From 2000 onwards, we started seeing component of social engineering. So this is what we covered yesterday: social engineering. We started seeing remote propagation of malware via emails. We started seeing competitors. So uh, malware A is fighting with malware B. Uh, and, and things like that. And we started seeing a prospective business demand in terms of spam. So you started seeing uh, these illegal pharmaceutical companies started using the spam method to sell their uh, counterfeit drugs and so on. Uh, a good example would be the Slammer or the Stormbot man. 
at this stage, it's already money oriented. So uh, income oriented, you started seeing money by performing DOS attacks, by doing phishing attacks, by sending these spam emails and so on. In 2010 onwards, you started seeing increased sophistication. You started seeing state-sponsored attackers. So remember Stuxnet example we spoke? So you have state-sponsored attackers. Uh, you started seeing coordinated malware altering. So state-sponsored, you don't see only one person doing it. You see a group of people working on the same malware. You see increased sophistication. They are weaponizing malware. For example, this ransomware is uh, also an example of uh, weaponizing it. So you, you, you encrypt your entire hard drive, and then you ask them to actually pay money. Otherwise, you don't let them uh, use it. They started having targeted victims and a purpose, as well as being stealthy and resilient. So Stuxnet, CryptoLocker are good examples. And right now, it's more financially oriented. You started seeing data exfiltration, ransom, uh, ransomware, and sabotage. And in 2020 onwards, it's the next generation that we're talking about. So we started seeing new, new things that are coming up. But whatever that we have seen in these uh, 2010 onwards is still very actively happening. OK, so let's look at some examples, selected examples of malware. So Trojan. So Trojan is actually a, um, a malware that it disguises itself as a desirable code or software. So if you have the habit of downloading key generators online, I can give you an example of how Trojan could work. So you might find an original key generator. So you will wrap around uh, that key generator with a Trojan so that when you click generate keys, you are actually installing a malware on your machine as well as showing you the key that that was uh, embedded in that same application. So you think that you have just generated the key, but what happened is that you have just released the malware onto your machine. So this is one example. It's why you can see a lot of these things. And that's why it's a bad habit to download counterfeit uh, applications. So um, sometimes you will just have to be careful. Right. If you, it's better to just use open source tools and you know exactly what you're clicking on your machine. It's perfectly fine. So Trojans may hide in games, apps, or even software patches, and they may be embedded in attachments included in phishing emails. <clears throat> Examples include Emotet and Zeus Botnet. Uh, Worm is a type of malware that spread copies of itself from computer to computer through the, through the network. Right, so a worm can replicate itself without any human interaction. No one has to say, please attack this particular machine. Once it's in a machine, it will actively propagate by itself. That's why I said, if your home, uh, the laptop that you're using right now at, at home or wherever you are right now, the moment that you connect it to a different network, your, mel your machine will propagate or will try to propagate it to other machines in the network. If, if at least one machine, one other machine is vulnerable to the same uh, uh, vulnerability that you're trying to exploit, that machine will be infected. And then the process will be, uh, how do I say, carried out by both you and the other machine on whichever networks that you are propagating to. Okay, and, and this one doesn't need to attach itself to a software program because it's, it's happening by itself. So example uh, is Stuxnet and SQL Slammer. These are famous uh, 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 worm-based uh, malware. Ransomware, we briefly spoke about ransomware yesterday. The top right image here is actually the, um, uh, the screen, the, the screen of a train station. So this is the um, notice uh, panel of the train station that tells you at which time, which train is arriving at which track basically. So at that moment, we, we were able to uh, snap a picture of this which is uh, indicating that this machine has been compromised by uh, uh, CryptoLocker. Oh, no, no, this is WannaCry. Yeah, WannaCry. So you have to pay that amount of money to Bitcoin, otherwise this system will be compromised. This is okay, this system is okay, but imagine that such a system in a hospital, if this is actually a very life, uh, life support kind of a device, it's a matter of life and death, right? So this is what uh, crypt, uh, ransomware is doing. And then you have the other classification of malware called Dropper. Dropper is a malware that installs additional malware on the infected machine for a smaller cost. Uh, so imagine that I already have 1000 machines that have infected uh, and you came up with a new malware and then you say that, you know what, I would like to create my own botnet. 
and or, or I would like to have my own in set of infected machines. Can you help me? I said, okay, maybe I will charge you one US dollars for one infection, which is relatively cheap. If I have 10,000 machines, I get $10,000 and I will just ask my machines, the, the machines that I'm already controlling, this 10,000 nodes to install this additional uh, application that you are asking me to install. But what would happen is that now you also have 10,000 machines that you are controlling and I too. So we will coexist and control those machines. So this is what malware droppers do. And uh, they are all often implemented as scripts or small executables and can serve as a stepping stone for proliferation of new botnets. Uh, example of such malware is Sality and Game Over Zeus, which bring us to the next topic of botnets. So what are botnets? Botnets are pretty much malware infected machines with a component of remote control, let's call it C2, plus someone to control it, let's call it bot master. And when you have these three components, you have something that we call botnet. And let's look into a more uh, technical description of what is a botnet. Botnet is um, a set of nodes uh, that is distributed around the globe that is infected with this malware. And therefore, they are, they are they're called zombies as well, or bots. And they are being controlled by a bot master to launch or, or to, to, to carry out malicious activities on behalf of the bot master. For example, I, I, I don't like my university or, or nah, bad example. Uh, I'm a, comp a competitor. So I have a competitor. I'm a banking industry, bank A. I don't like bank B. I can actually ask a friend of mine who is a bot master, hey, could you please uh, take down bot B's, uh, sorry, uh, bank B's online portal, for example. I said, uh, I mean, my friend will say, sure, sure, for a short, for a small money, I will do it. So I'll say, okay, fine, I'll get you a beer. You carry out this attack. And after that, uh, they will actually um, launch attack on this particular online banking web server, rendering normal users not able to access uh, this particular online service. And as such, after that, I will come up and say, yeah, I told you, you should have actually contacted me or come as my customer because we have the best security for our online services and so on. So I might be able to actually drove off the uh, customers to my side and it's profitable to me compared to what I would have paid to my friend, so, right? And yesterday I mentioned about this uh, very high DDoS traffic and yes, it was on GitHub for 1.3 terabytes per second, uh, terabits per second in 2018, um, yeah. So it has been reported in the world. You've also seen different kinds of malicious activities, for example, Google uh, AdSense uh, exploitations in the past. So Google AdSense worked like this. So if you have a website, you would have noticed that there are some advertisements that are uh, hosted on the right or somewhere in the page, right? If it's on Facebook, I think it was on the right in the past. Now I'm not sure anymore. So what happens is that Different scenario, I'm an owner. So I have a very popular website. I decided to subscribe to Google AdSense. I tell Google, hey, I, I have a lot of customers, uh, readers that come to my blog. I would like to subscribe to this AdSense so that my readers can see these advertisements. And if they're interested, they can click it and I will get paid by the clicks, maybe one cent per click. So that's how normally it works. But now I have a website, which is not popular. But again, I contact my friend, I say, hey, can you help me? Can you introduce some uh, artificial clicks on my web, on, on these advertisements hosted on my web page? So if, if I should get one cent from Google per click, if my friend has 10,000 uh, bots that he controls around the world, that would imitate 10,000 person clicking on that uh, ad at a certain point in time. And that should translate into 10,000 cents 10,000 cents, it will be what, $100 or $1,000 that I'm supposed to actually get in terms of uh, remuneration from Google AdWords, right? But this doesn't apply anymore. Google has a lot of uh, AI intelligence to identify and distinguish between artificial and uh, uh, natural clicks. But, but this is how it was because uh, Zero Access is a botnet that was reported in 2012 to be able to milk close to 100,000 US dollars from 1 million zombies. This is what Zero Access was doing in the past. So these are some examples of what uh, botnets could do. Basically, I just gave you two examples. I won't go into more details, but let's look at other type of uh, details of botnets. 
So botnets predominantly have different architectures. The most common one is the centralized architecture. So uh, they use a command and control server or C2 server, where all these machines will contact to the C2 server and ask for a uh, new update from the bot master. So this could be an IRC server. It could be a web server. Now a bot master will just have to send the update to this uh, C2 server and everyone will get the update from the C2 server. So it's, it's on a pull or a push base uh, mechanism from this uh, architecture. However, this kind of architecture serves itself as a single point of failure. So imagine that I have one of this malware infecting my honeypot. By looking at what's, what is it doing for my honeypot, I can see that this malware is trying to contact this particular C2 server. If I'm, I'm talking from a perspective of a defender. So, let's say I'm working for the law, uh, law enforcement agencies or I'm a security uh, researcher. Now I know where is the C2 server this particular malware is talking to just by looking at the IP and port. Then I can inform the relevant stakeholders and I say, this is an active C2 server. We need to take it down because we know the IP. We know where is it hosted. We can immediately take, take that uh, C2 server down. And hence, if I take it down, all the bots will no longer be able to communicate to the bot master. Now, uh, seeing that this is a problem, that a C2 server can be easily taken down, recent, architect uh, recent botnets have adopted the peer-to-peer -peer architecture uh, in, in deploying newer botnets. So what happens is that you don't have any centralized component, therefore you cannot do any centralized monitoring. When I say centralized monitoring is that, um, yeah, I forgot to mention this. So centralized monitoring here means if I have access to the logs of this server, just by looking at what are the IPs that requested resources from this server, I will immediately be able to identify what are the infected machines around the globe just by using the IP address, right? So then you have the time information, you have the IP information, then you can backtrack into which machine or which device was actually uh, given which IP at which point in time. And therefore you can easily identify uh, or monitor this botnet by looking at the network logs. So without that, you can't uh, take down the servers and then you can't actually uh, perform centralized monitoring. So in peer-to-peer -peer architecture, instead of the centralized architecture, uh, uh, instead of a C2 server, all bots, have, um, the, all bots are interconnected via an overlay. An overlay is simply a virtual connection from one node to another node. So they can be on different continents, but it's just one hop away. That's, that's what the overlay is all about. And uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer architecture, a bot master can choose any one node, any one that he wants. He can pick one, just send a command, and this command will be disseminated to other people on a hop-to-hop -hop fashion, right? And, and eventually the, the update will be sent to all bots. So this is the reason peer-to-peer -peer architectures are more resilient uh, and, and more stealthy from the perspective of a bot master. So just to summarize the different architectures, you have this centralized architecture, um, uh, which is quick to set up, very low latency. So whatever command that you put will be immediately delivered to the bots, but it serves itself as a single point of failure. You have this decentralized architecture. Um, decentralized architecture introduce latencies, uh, sorry, introduce redundancies. So which means you have more than one server. If they manage to take down one server, you still have server B and server C, for example. It is still low latency, but it still serves itself as a single point of failures. So in this case, it uses three C2, but if I take these three C2s, the, the, the botnets are, I mean, the bots are often again. Now the P2P architecture increases resiliency because even if you remove one node, every other node is still connected by themselves. So if you are talking about 10,000 nodes, the only way is to take down 10,000 bots, which is not realistic to take down. Take down is in, to, to, to physically take it down or, or disconnect it from the internet. Uh, it has distributed communication, but it has high latency. So whatever command that the bot master sends will take some time before it's propagated to everyone else. Yeah, but, but that's something I think for peer-to-peer -peer botnets we can deal with, high latency. The C2 channels or the command and control channel uh, can be categorized as two. So it's either using a push-based mechanism or a pull-based mechanism. A push-based mechanism means a bot master places a command on a C2 server and the bots will pull or pull the uh, update from the server. 
uh, in, in the other version is a push-based mechanism. So if a bot master plays a command in the C2 server, the C2 server pushes this command to the, uh, to the bots. So there's two ways of this command can be disseminated. This push-based mechanism will be almost instantaneous, so very low latency. Pull-based mechanism depends on the interval that the bots are pulling. So the, the longer the delay, the more time it takes to actually disseminate the command. So uh, example of C2 channels for botnet uh, with C2, we have uh, some examples. We have IRCs, uh, IRC servers, we have domain name servers, and we have DGA, so domain gen generation algorithm. We will look into some of these examples. IRC, I, I'm not sure if uh, we still have people uh, that are aware of what is IRC. Whenever I deliver this discussion or this topic, the youngsters at least, they do not know what is IRC anymore. But for those who know, then you can recall. So the, uh, IRC is very quick and simple to set up. You can just create a channel and immediately use it. It's an efficient coordination tool because it has low latency and the solution exists. So how does it work? You have bots. The bots will turn themselves as IRC clients. They will try to contact or try to connect to a particular server that I would have already um, hard coded in their uh, binary or during infection. Let's say that they are supposed to connect to my server, whatever server it is, on channel I am there. So these bots, after infection, as long as they have internet connection, they will connect into this uh, channel and wait for further action. So in, in other words, they are polling for new updates through the IRC server. And they wait for new commands. And when the bot master issues a command, say that, okay, please launch DDoS attack on this website. I will push this as a command to the channel. And bots in this channel will pull this command and will know that, oh, okay, my master asked me to perform a DDoS on this website and I will carry out this attack immediately. And that's how it works for IRC servers. So this is an example of a push-based mechanism. Now, the drawback of IRC servers is that, again, it's a centralized architecture. It has single point of failure or a single point of monitoring. Network administrators could easily block IRC net, uh, traffic at their network level. In fact, most uh, corporate organizations have this rule in place, whereby uh, IRC traffic uh, is not allowed within, oh, sorry, inside or outside of their, uh, or going through their network, basically. But, uh, and in addition, IRC is, is a well-known protocol, which also means that if a botnet is using it, defenders can easily understand, pass the replies to understand how things are working in the network itself. The second example we're going to talk about is DNS records. So the purpose is to carry out stealthy data infiltration or exfiltration. Why? Uh, so DNS protocol or DNS traffic is the most critical protocol in most uh, hosts or networks, and it's hardly blacklisted. Most network will allow DNS traffic to go because that's how internet works. And uh, DPI or deep packet inspection is often costly. We spoke about uh, resource efficiency when we spoke about network monitoring and, and why we chose to do NetFlow instead of deep packet inspection. And, and that's the same reason here. So most system, most organizations do not do DPI and therefore it's quite safe to use DNS as a C2 channel. How is this is done? Uh, we leverage the DNS request to perform tunneling. Now imagine that on the left, we have this compromised system and let's assume that it has the IP address of 9.8.7.6, host name, username, and the system ID. And this malware has been infected, and this malware would like to report to the bot master, hey, this is, my, uh, this is the details of the infected machine. So what I will do is that I will perform a DNS request to a particular DNS server, uh, create a, a, a type A record, and query the following. So if you, if you realize, did I have the, okay. So the query consists of information about the bot itself, uh, about the machine itself, that I form in a way of uh, as though that I'm querying for this uh, domain, right? Blah, 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 dot uh, badwebsite.com, all right? Now, badwebsite.com is the C2 uh, infrastructure or the DNS server that is being uh, deployed by the bot master so that when this query gets uh, delivered to this server, badsite.com, Oh, sorry, um, the, the DNS server that is managing this uh, C2, 
it will be able to actually know that, aha, so I have a new response. Uh, so I have a new infected machine because it just reported back to me. Now, this DNS request would not be blocked because DNS request is important in a network. So unless you are able to distinguish that, okay, this is a normal DNS record and this is an abnormal DNS record, it's very difficult to actually identify or prevent uh, such uh, DNS, DNS C2 based uh, botnets. And this DNS server could then send another reply, uh, consist of, yeah, okay, now do this, or please wait further until I tell you something else. So that's definitely possible. Okay. Uh, any question on this DNS part? If it is not clear, I can explain further. So if there is any question, I'm also looking at the chat uh, panel from time to time, just let me know. Okay, so the drawback of a DNS C2 channel is that it can be easily detected by the spike of failed DNS requests. So if you know about how DNS records uh, on the replies look like, just looking at the NX domain replies, you will know that, okay, these are domains that have been taken down or uh, domain res uh, when you look at the value of the DNS resolution with very low TTLs, that could also indicate uh, um, uh, the usage of C2, uh, sorry, usage of DNS as C2 channel. So by the way, whenever you see this icon defender, you are referring to uh, um, research security researchers, network administrators, or uh, law enforcement agencies. Okay, uh, another interesting thing that also uses DNS uh, would be domain generation algorithms. It doesn't exactly use DNS, but uh, I will explain this further. The purpose of such a C2 channel is to increase the resilience of C2s against takedowns. So the moment that we know that, okay, this C2 is using this particular infected machine or this particular uh, exploited web server, it can be taken down easily. So Portmaster saw that, ah, how many times do I have to fix this problem? So they came up with DGA. So DGA allows them to quickly switch C2 domains and they can resurrect botnets if they are being taken down. How? Okay, so first DGA is, uh, DGA, the name itself implies domain generation algorithm. It means that every malware or every bot in the botnet will be able to generate a set of domains. How? They have a seed value that is known to the malware itself. And for example, they will simply take today's date. Today is 20th of November, 2020. I will take this as a seed value into an existing algorithm that all of my infected machines would know. And when I use this date, I will generate these four different uh, domains. So this, uh, these domains will be different if I generated using yesterday's date or tomorrow's date. But today, this is the domain that will be connected. So uh, it will be generated. And everyone will be able to synchronize themselves on which domain should we look for today. And the bot master will just have to, uh, um, how do I say, uh, deploy his C2 channel in one of these domain. Right? As long as he's able to uh, generate or register a domain, he can actually control the botnet. So it's as simple as that. And uh, uh, as long as it's connected, the bots will always remain uh, responsive to the bot mask. Okay, I just mentioned this. So current date, month, or year is uh, very uh, predictable. So I can always know what's going to happen in two weeks time, what's going to happen in two months time. And that is also how uh, defenders take down such DGA based format. However, more uh, advanced malware could actually use the popular current trending Twitter hashtag, for example, because this is something you can't predict. What is popular today may not be popular tomorrow, but if that hashtag is actually being used as an input or the seed for this DGA itself, then uh, your set of the generated domains will be different. So defenders cannot predict this upfront. So Boardmaster has an upper hand if he uses mm -hmm. this technique. So uh, in this case, if you, if you realize that um, the malware tried to actually resolve four different domains from a normal DNS server, it could be Google DNS server, 
And then you will see that for the first three uh, domains, it received an NX domain reply, which means domain not exists. But the fourth one uh, has a domain that is being replied. So that will be the domain that the malware will use to communicate to the botmaster or to upload the data that it has collected from your infected machine. So if it has stolen your banking credentials, it will push your details into the C2 server based on that. So the drawback of this mechanism is that it's similar to the DNS-based C2 channels. C10 algorithm can be discovered via reverse engineering, can be used to generate future domains and, and block them. That, that's how uh, recently Microsoft mm -hmm. took down the Necus botnet. So they managed to actually blacklist the series of uh, domains that will be used by the bot for the next two years. So um, uh, I think they have gotten court order to prevent those domains from being uh, connected or registered by anyone. So when you do that, you can prevent the bot master from being able to contact, or oh, sorry, uh, control them for the next two years. So this is a common strategy. Now moving forward uh, to peer-to-peer -peer botnets, we need to actually go into details of what are peer-to-peer uh, -peer botnets and how do they work. Let's briefly look at the recent trends of P2P botnets. The table here indicates a chronological um, appearance of botnets and what their name are and uh, are they still active. If you realize that uh, it started in 2006 and it's still going on in 2020, but between 2011 and 2016, that's a big gap. Why? That was the, the period where law enforcement agencies, especially FBI uh, in, in the States, were actively taking down botnets around the globe. So we have uh, a lot of cases, uh, like in 2012, we have uh, Kelly Host B that was sinkholed. In 2013, we have Zero Access that was taken down. In 2014, we have the Game Over Zeus that was taken down. So it was a, how do I say, a botnet takedown spree back then. And that has reduced, I mean, from, from my observation, that has reduced the emergence of new malware. But from 2016 onwards, oh, sorry, before that, for Game Over Zeus, the FBI even released a wanted a, a notice, a Interpol, Europol notice, that gives an award of close to 3 million US dollars for anyone mm -hmm. that can actually give information about this person. Uh, this is Bogachev, and he is claimed to be the person behind Game Over Zeus. So he is still not found. And uh, some people claim that he's working for the Russian government. We don't know. But if you know anything, you can actually get $3 million. So that's how lucrative is this business uh, being a defender in the domain of uh, botnets. Anyway, moving forward from 2016, you started seeing new botnets that's emerging. Uh, we see Hajime. Uh, Hajime uh, was actually a subsequent uh, variant of the Mirai botnet. I think Dr. Anbar would have presented his work on Dr. Mirai, uh, you know, on the Mirai botnet. And Hajime was built on top of that. But uh, it's still interesting because Hajime seems like a white hat attacker. So he's just preventing Mirai from, uh, uh, how do I say, infecting more machines. So if it manages to infect a machine, it patches all the vulnerabilities that some of the other botnets are trying to exploit. So, and, and it looks like it's a white hat uh, attacker. Uh, we, we still have no idea how it works, but it's still up there. And then we saw DDG, which is a, a, a big mining botnet that is targeting Redis and Orient DB servers. And uh, 2018, we saw HNS botnet or hide and seek botnet. Uh, that's uh, focusing on IoT devices. And then 2019, we saw Roboto. Roboto uh, exploits uh, Linux web in servers. Uh, 2019 also saw the emergence of Mozi that uses uh, the BitTorrent DHT network. Uh, and then we have IPFS storm. And recently, in 2020, the HEH port, also IoT. Now, what we have seen from 2016 until now is the emergence of Linux as well as IoT-based botnets. Be, prior to that, it was exclusively Windows-based botnets. 
So, but, but the ones that I've highlighted like IPFS storm, it's also Windows and Linux. So they are also going cross operating systems as well. But this is what's happening for portable board nets. And moving forward, we need to understand the two different types of P2P architectures. Um, the first one is structured P2P botnet. We, we won't go too much into detail, so you don't have to know all these details, just follow through uh, and ask questions if you are curious. So DHT is something um, like a phone book, so to say. So every node has an identifier or a number, and you will easily be able to find resources like in, in BigTorrent, you're finding for a file. Uh, let's say you're finding for a PDF document. Uh, let's say botnet.pdf. You will hash it, and this hash information will be the ID that you will look like, uh, so look for in the phone book of this DHT. And whoever that is closest to this address will be returned, and you can ask him and be able to access for this information. And uh, yeah, so bot masters will exploit the system by placing a command on this uh, phone book. Uh, in other words, similar to these DGA based botnet, the bot masters will be able to specify at which location a bot should actually look for a command every day or every week or every month. So again, they have this uh, seed and the algorithm that generates these so-called keys that can be used by the bots to search for the newest updates from the bot master. So finding nodes or commands are efficient in structured network. For example, the Kademlia DHT. And uh, structured peer-to-peer -peer botnets are either exclusively bot network or can be parasitic on existing peer-to-peer -peer systems. So uh, Mozi is one example where it's sitting on top of a uh, BitTorrent network. The IP storm is another example where it sits on top of the IPFS system. So which means they are normal usage, but the botnets are leaching or being parasites on the network itself. But the more common set of botnets uh, nowadays is that the unstructured P2P -P botnet, where you don't have any uh, mandatory user, uh, sorry, unique IDs, and it uses a, a gossiping protocol, or you can see it as a multicast protocol. And bot masters issues command uh, via peer to peer method. And it's inefficient to find specific resources or node because you have to use gossiping or flooding to, to reach all nodes. And in most cases, it's only exclusively bot network. And, and as I mentioned, most uh, peer to peer botnets adopt the unstructured architecture. And as such, let's look at how unstructured peer to peer botnets look like or what, how do they operate. Okay, let's imagine that this is how the bots are actually interconnected. So I give them labels uh, A until J, so I'm going to refer them. Each bot in an unstructured p 2 botnet has something called a membership maintenance mechanism. This mechanism ensures that all bots are remain connected over the overlay. How? Each bot will have something called a neighbor list. This list typically consists of 50 to 1000 entries in the botnets that we have seen. But in this example, I'm going to just show a neighbor list of size three. And uh, the contents of this neighbor list is usually nodes that we classify as super peers. Super peers are nodes that have public IP address or directly reachable over the internet. So let's take node, node D or bot D in this example. D is connected to E, F, and G. So the neighbor list of D will look like this, where, I mean, each entry will consist of IP and port of your neighbor. So uh, the membership management mechanism itself requires bot D or every bot to probe the responsive of responsiveness of its neighbors every fixed MM interval. This in, in the bots that we have seen, it's between 256 seconds up to 40 minutes, uh, but technically it's just a fixed interval. So what, what node D will do is that it will send a message. You can consider it as a hello message or a heartbeat message just checking whether the other person is online. And uh, let's imagine G is offline, therefore G would not be able to respond and only E and F is responding. When this happened, node D now knows that G is not responsive because he didn't get any reply. And uh, to allow a bot not to be isolated from the overlay, the membership maintenance mechanism allows uh, 
and the entries to be updated or replaced if necessary. In this case, D will ask one of its existing neighbors. In this uh, example, I'm going to take F because F was responsive. And he will say, hey, F, I don't have enough neighbors. Can you share me some of your neighbors? F will say, sure, why not consider I? And then he will give information about I and D will now consider I to be replaced with G. So at this point, D has all the neighbors online uh, and uh, G is now replaced because G is uh, unresponsive. Now, this process of membership maintenance mechanism allows peer-to-peer uh, -peer botnets to self-sustain themselves. They self-organize, they self-heal by themselves. Botmaster do not have to worry at all. That's the cool thing about this, uh, this architecture. Now, the second class of peer-to-peer uh, -peer botnets, uh, the second class of bots is called the non-superpeers. Non-superpeers are nodes that are behind firewall or NAT-like device, which means you have stateful firewalls. You are sitting behind it. Therefore, these nodes can contact the superpeers, but the superpeers can't contact you. So I, I, I think that most of you already understand why is this so. If it is not clear, please ask me, I can explain. And another important process that we need to know is how a peer-to-peer -peer botnet bootstraps into the network. Let's imagine that I have a, my, my laptop with IP 1.2.3.4 and uh, it is infected by a machine. And uh, the very first time, it will try to announce itself to some existing super peer, which means when my machine is infected, I will have a set of lists that I call the bootstrap nodes that indicates these are some of the nodes that most likely would be online. That's the node on the right. I'm calling it existing super peer. So what, what I will do upon infection is that I will bind to a particular port, a dedicated port. Uh, let's call it server side and indicated by green color. And then I will use ephemeral port for client side communication. So peer-to-peer -peer botnets have this client server communication. Server communication is to look for incoming replies. And uh, the uh, client side communication is to communicate to other bots, basically. So the common bootstrapping process is to test the reachability of my server side. So because this is the way that the bots will know whether they are a super peer or they are not. So what we'll do is that we will send this uh, message to test myself uh, to one of these existing super peer. So this message will consist of information about my green port, which is my server port. And when this message is received by the super peer, the super peer will know that, ah, node 1234 wants me to check if it is reachable via port green. So I will send another message, or like the heartbeat message, trying to reach that port. And if uh, it is reachable, this node IP 1.3.4 will reply accordingly. And based on that, the, the other super peer will say, ah, okay, it is reachable. So it will include node 1.2.3.4 into its neighbor list and respond to the first message saying that, hey, you are a super peer. And from that point onwards, I am an active super peer and information about myself can be disseminated by either by myself or the person that I spoke to earlier. And, and more people will know about me eventually. And the, the other example is, uh, let's say we are considering the non superior example. Um, I want to check and send a message, but in between I have a wireless access point that works like a nut. And therefore my server port will not be contacted or will not be reachable. And since there was a failure to get a reply on that port, the existing super peer will conclude that node 1234 is not reachable via port green. So it will respond to the original message saying that, hey, you are not a super peer, but you can remain connected to me. And that's it. So that's how the bootstrapping process takes place in peer to peer bot. Now, th that's all that you need to know about peer to peer botnets. Now we will immediately look at. Uh, uh, how the peer-to-peer -peer botnet threat mitigation lifecycle looks like. In the inception, so the new malware comes up, we have phase one, which is trying to detect them. We detect emerging bots or malware using combination of tools such as, we spoke about this, IDS-based detection mechanisms, could be Zig, could be Snort. Um, uh, one example of this is uh, the work of, uh, well, so IDS-based detection mechanism is one thing, but you can have uh, custom botnet detection tools. For example, the Peer Hunter 
solution that uh, utilizes some graph theory to identify uh, behavior of peer-to-peer -peer bottlenecks. I will try to explain this at the end because this is the work that we used for our uh, DCNDS peer-to-peer uh, -peer bottleneck detection mechanism. So we have honeypots. We also spoke about honeypots in the previous uh, session. There's a lot of honeypots and uh, the ones on top is some of the honeypots integrated by the solution called teapot. So you have multiple kinds of honeypots that are packaged together. So you can use that or you can use Dionea, for example, as a standalone tool. And you can also use malware sandboxes like Cuckoo to run your malware and see whether it's malicious or not. <clears throat> so this is the phase one. So now that we know that this particular malware exists or a new malware has been detected, the emerging malware, what do we do next? The next step is to reverse engineer. Reverse engineering is done using tools like IDA Pro, Ghidra, and so on. It is aimed at understanding the custom communication protocol. So PDP botnets often utilize custom communication protocols because it's harder because they use custom encryptions and so on as well as we need to extract the seat list. Remember the bootstrap list for you to bootstrap yourself? We need to get this. So for that, we have to reverse engineer the malware. Now, reverse engineering is critical, but it's time consuming uh, activity. Um, by the way, I still have like 10 slides to go. So if it's too late, please uh, let me know. Uh, I mean, if you are running too late after, uh, for, for, for time factors, please, please let me know. So phase two of this threat mitigation lifecycle is called monitoring. Um, where monitoring is conducted to enumerate the infected machines. So basically we want to know what are the IP address of the machines participating in the botnet because we can then alert the stakeholders. We can inform the ISPs, we can inform the network administrators that, hey, this, this IPs of your network are participating in this botnet. And you as a network administrator, will now know, ah, okay, this machine is participating as a botnet. I should look into my IDS reports. And if I can find or cannot find, I should inform the owner to disconnect himself, clean up his machine, and then reconnect to the network, for example. In the best case, we can identify the control infrastructures to take down any drop of servers if, if they exist. Or uh, we could probably do bot master attribution to identify who is the person who's controlling the botnet. So these are the, the purpose of us trying to do monitoring. Common monitoring mechanisms, we have two. One is called crawlers, and another thing is called sensors. Now I'm going to briefly explain how these mechanisms work. First, let's look at crawlers. Crawlers mm -hmm. mimic bots in need of neighbors, right? So remember earlier when I was explaining, I was telling that bot D can ask to bot F uh, of bot G, sorry, bot F, uh, can you pass me some of your neighbors because I don't have enough neighbors? This is what we will exploit, right? By exploiting this uh, or by mimicking this, we will be able to enumerate bots, mostly super fierce, and discover how are they interconnected. For this, we need to develop a crawler, which could be a Python script, uh, any script that you want or any program that you want, which will require our reverse engineering knowledge on the protocols to form this net, uh, neighborless request message. We need to know how to form this message and we'll use this developed crawler to send this message to one of the node that we know from the seed list, our bootstrap node. Let's assume we already know node A. We will send this message to node A. Now node A, when receive this message, will not be able to distinguish that we are not a bot because from a network perspective, it's the same communication message. It is the same encryption. So it will just assume, ah, okay, this is just another friend or another bot that needs neighbors. Therefore, it will say, hey, sure, guy, uh, this is my neighbors, which is B, C, and D. Now from, from the defender's perspective, now we know A is connected to B, C, and D. Now we can use graph search algorithms to choose any one of these nodes, BFS or DFS. Let's say I'm choosing D for this matter. When I send this message, D will say who it's connected to. And based on that, now I know, okay, D is connected to E, F, and G. If I repeat this process, eventually I can reconstruct how the botnet is interconnected again, or how are they interconnected? So this is how crawlers work. And this information is stored as a snapshot, as a directed graph or an edgeless. Now the drawback of a crawler is that you can only crawl super peers. You can't crawl non-superpeers, which is 60 to 90% of the whole botnet population. 
And uh, this brings us to the next uh, monetary mechanism called, uh, okay, before that, this is how the visual representation of the topology of bots in game over zoos with some graph uh, layouting applied. So uh, the green lines are actually edges. So who's connected to whom? The blue dots are actually uh, the uh, nodes itself. So the very big rubber ball in the middle is indicating how each nodes in this rubber ball are having the other ones within the rubber ball as their neighbors. So it, it has a very tight core and uh, have, uh, so it has a very dense core and slightly sparse rings out of it. So this is how the botnet looked like during its peak time. Now I, I mentioned that we have a drawback with crawling. So to address that drawback, we deploy sensors. Sensors just need to mimic reliable and stable superpairs. Remember that I mentioned during the MM mechanism, a message will be sent to say hello and uh, or a heartbeat message and you are expected to respond, right? And sensor will do exactly that. When someone is saying hello, whenever someone is sending this heartbeat message, this sensor will just say, yes, I am here. That's the only thing that uh, a sensor will need to do. And uh, it does this uh, to enumerate both superpairs and non-superpairs. As I mentioned, it has to res reliably respond to probe message. And the ultimate goal is to be popular among all bots. We will, do, we will uh, implement this uh, sensor to understand incoming probe message and how to reply using the protocols. And then we will bootstrap node S into the network by exploiting the bootstrap mechanism of the botnet itself. So the other nodes, node D, F, and G will think that ah, S is just another bot. I will include you in my neighbor list because you're a super peer. And after that, if we wait enough time, node C might need additional neighbors and it might ask node D and node D will say, well, why not consider S? And now I will start seeing C having incoming connections uh, from the perspective of S, right? Because C needed extra neighbors and S is reliable. So it has been shared and C will include S in its neighbor list. If we wait long enough, Nodes behind super peers, I mean, nodes behind that, like super non super peer nodes, will also need additional neighbors. And eventually, they will ask one of these guys that already know our sensor, like say node C. And when this information is being sent to this uh, non super peer, from the sensor's perspective, sensor S perspective, we will start seeing incoming connections from nodes that are non super peers. This is the point where we are able to enumerate both super peers and non super peers. When I say no, uh, enumerate, I'm talking about IP pod combination. So that's enough for me to enumerate, to know that, okay, that this is a new bot that I've never seen before. If you wait long enough, you will start seeing incoming connection from everywhere in the network. The, the main drawback of sensors is that you won't be able to discover the interconnectivity of the bots. You will know that this is the maximum number of bots that exist, but you cannot identify how are they interconnected. Therefore, you have to merge both the information from the crawler and sensor to get the best information out of it. And this is how it looked like for Celity Botnet on 1st April, 2015. So it, it, it's, uh, it's all around the world. So this is for one particular botnet. Okay, and once you've finished monitoring it, you can now uh, react on it, which is phase three. So this phase is particularly relevant for the law enforcement agencies. The initial presentation was tailored for the German uh, community. So BKA is the uh, Bundeskriminalamt. You can think of it uh, uh, like this uh, federal uh, homeland services, I think. Um, I'm not sure how to actually map it to the um, Philippines context, but imagine that you have something, uh, some department, governmental uh, organization in charge for cybersecurity in your organization. It could be Interpol as well. So this is where phase three is most relevant. We can, now we already monitor them. We know where they're located. We know how are they interconnected. We can now disrupt them, right? So I, earlier I mentioned to you that we cannot take down each bot manually. 10,000 nodes, we cannot clean them manually, but we can disrupt them. And how is this possible? Number one, you can perform bot master or malware author traceback and attribution. Uh, you use open source intelligence, uh, law enforcement agencies 
internal Intel and so on. So this requires cross collaboration across different different LEAs. And number two is what we do in, in our research, which is trying to disrupt the underlay or overlay. So how we can do that is that we can try to position, partition, or sinkhole the network. Uh, so this is more about, uh, I, I will give an example of how this is happening, but what's important to, uh, uh, to note is that it requires careful planning and thorough consideration of potential consequences. So how sinkholing attack looks like, imagine that uh, we are, so the requirements first. It is only possible if the following can be carried out through network communication alone. If you are able to invalidate peer and trace of a bot, for example, we are looking at node G, can I make node G forget about I and H? That's, that's first requirement. And second, can I let G or can I influence G to connect to someone else? If I have these two requirements fulfilled from the network perspective, then I can actually carry out my attack. The first step is to have a sensor that is uh, well popularized throughout the network. And after that, I will break down their communication to other bots, make sure that they don't they don't know anyone other, make sure they do not know how to contact to other bots and they will only know our sensor. This is what I have to do. And after that, I will activate my sinkhole, which means if a bot master decides to send a command to node I, this command, node I will obviously try to send to sinkhole, but the sinkhole will actually not forward this uh, to the other nodes. Therefore, only node I will have the latest command. Everyone else will not be able to get the latest command from the bot master. So that's how sinkhole is being carried out. But the point is the sinkhole server itself has to be carried out for a longer period of time. You cannot do it short for a short period of time. And of course, you should not be able to, I mean, the botnet must not have a secondary bootstrap mechanism to reestablish this communication. Remember we spoke about DGA. So some botnets have DGA on top of the peer-to-peer -peer communication so that uh, if they have a logic of, if you did not receive a command from the bot master for six months, fall back onto DGA. And that way, after six months, the bot master can now regain access to the botnet. So these are some requirements you have to consider. So if they reconnect, then the sync call will not work anymore. So in order to satisfy the requirements one and two, it, uh, it requires that we have a vulnerability in the, the botnet binary that we can exploit to invalidate peer entries or inject new peer entries. So that is sync calling. Now to sum up the peer-to-peer -peer botnet threat mitigation lifecycle, we have this traffic light uh, indicators, red, yellow, and green uh, within phase one and phase two. So in phase one, you have no limit, uh, no or limited information. You only know about, okay, there exists some malware and I know about the bootstrap list. After reverse engineering, I have more information. I know about how new, new bots are infected because I can, I can crawl over time and I can mm -hmm. see new bots mm -hmm. joining the network. And after that, I will have near complete information, which means I can reconstruct the overall topology. I can understand how churn is happening. I can actually do stakeholder mapping, coordinate with the uh, law enforcement agencies to perform takedown and so on. And once this is done, provided I can take it down, the botnet will be disabled. And then the process repeats again when you see a new uh, malware emerging uh, in the world. Now, just two more slides uh, to, to sum up. Uh, we, we have this project, TCNDS, um, uh, where we deploy a peer-to-peer -peer botnet detection mechanism. The goal was to actually uh, set up a distributed and cloud-based network defense system, which consists of two main components. The first one, distributed monitoring, monitoring nodes embedded in each NREN. Uh, so we have one in Philippines, one in Indo uh, Indonesia, one in Bangladesh, and one in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the first component. And the second component is a cloud-based web security service platform to manage web security for participating institutions. So all these four different countries. So how? So we deploy the, the work that I mentioned earlier, uh, it's called Peer Hunter on all of these networks. So we have tested it out in Malaysia. We are currently setting up in uh, Indonesia and waiting for uh, some, some te technical arrangements in for Philippines and Bangladesh 
before we set up on those machines as well. So servers, equipments are all there. It's a matter of setting it up and let the data to be fed to the five-way node that is hosted in MyRAN. So that's where we will also deploy our network security dashboard. And uh, uh, hopefully this, uh, this data will then be able to be accessed by the corresponding partners. And, and uh, this is a very simple view of how the uh, corresponding uh, dashboard would look like based on our detection algorithm. It will actually show that, okay, what are the infected machines around the globe that is communicating to some infected machines in those uh, organizations that have deployed this peer hunter solution. You can of course uh, drill deeper to see a heat map of uh, uh, which part of the network or which part of the country or the location that the infection is uh, quite prominent. So with that, I would like to summarize my talk. And uh, so we have introduced malware and peer-to-peer -peer botnets along with the threat mitigation lifecycle. And I've, I believe that you can understand the severity of the issue that the threat posed by botnets are quite imminent. And we need to anticipate the next wave of botnet evolution. So there's a lot of research, there's a lot of uh, collaboration work that is required. And we hope that DC, DCNDS project would be one of the stepping stones towards this. If you are interested in collaboration, I welcome each and every one of you to contact us. Uh, if you need my contacts, you, have, you can simply search for my uh, contact details, ask the organizers, or you can see the uh, email that is visible on the slide now. With that, I would like to end my uh, talk today. Thank you.